Hello everyone, welcome to today's video. So if you have been preparing for the PMP exam, you must have come across this dilemma. How much do I really need to memorize for the PMP exam? Do I need to memorize the 49 process chart of the PMBOK or the process group practice guide? Or do I need to memorize each and every formula from the earned value management topic such as CPI, SPI, TCPI, ESE, BSE, etc. Okay, mind boggling, right? Even taking a step further, how much really do I need to memorize about the various agile concepts such as backlog refinement, spike, scrum ban, acceptance test driven development or ATDD, etc. Okay, so these are very common questions which come into the mind of PMP exam aspirants and they often, due to the lack of right guidance, end up taking the wrong strategy to tackle this challenge, okay? Now, which eventually reflects in the exam results. So in this video today, I will guide you through the detailed framework of how you should tackle this entire memorization aspect of the PMP exam, okay? So we will break down this video into three very critical sections and especially the third strategy which we are going to discuss is going to be the backbone of this entire framework, okay? Which means even if you learn and apply the first two strategies well, they will not give you the results if you are not able to integrate them with this third strategy. So make sure you watch the video till the very end and basically internalize the full framework when it comes to decode the memorization aspect of the PMP exam. Now, even if you choose to drop off in between, make sure you do come back to this video and complete your learning process, okay? So if you are really excited to start learning, please give this video a like and let's get the discussion started. Right, so let's get started with today's video. So as part of today's agenda, we'll start with understanding what is meant by memorization. So it is very important as a foundational step for you to understand this, okay? Next, we'll talk about the various topics in the PMP exam syllabus, which calls for memorization. So we'll look at various aspects across the PMP exam syllabus, which let's say makes you think that, okay, to learn this topic, I do need to memorize, okay? So these kind of things. So we'll look at those topics, which uh, quote unquote theoretically calls for a memorization. Now we'll try to understand that how much memorization is required for those topics. And I think that is the basic intent of this video. And then across the next three sections, we'll be talking about the three key strategies which you need to take as a PMP exam aspirant to make sure that you do not fall into this memorization trap. OK, so very important for you to stay with me till the end of this video and moving along for all the three strategies, we'll be doing some practice Q&A's as well. So you'll basically see that how I am applying that technique in terms of solving questions and answers which are very similar to your actual PMP exam. And that will provide you confidence in terms of the entire memorization aspect of the PMP exam, right? So with that expectation being set, let's start with the first topic, which is what is meant by memorization, guys, right? So if you look at the dictionary definition of memorization, it is the process of committing something to memory or learn something by heart, right? Now, if you see that there is no negative connotation associated with this entire memorization technique, right? So the process of committing something to the memory or learning something by heart, that doesn't necessarily is a bad thing, right? Because in the fraternity of PMP exam aspirants, everybody talks about memorization like it's something which is like a taboo, right? So it's definitely not. So we'll try to understand that throughout this entire video. But going by the definition, it is very important for you to understand that the definition of the term memorization doesn't have any negative connotation associated with it, okay? Now, let's talk about the two types of memorization. So if you broadly categorize the memorization process, it typically falls into two types, okay? Let's look at the first type of memorization and that is called a rote memorization, okay? An example could be, go back to your class six, class seven standard, where you used to memorize such algebraic formulas, right? Which is A plus B whole cube, which is A cube plus three A square B plus three AB square plus B cube, right? Probably many of us remember this even today. 
Now, the thing is, for these kind of memorization techniques, there is basically very less logic and very high rote learning capability, right? So what do I mean by rote learning capability? Now, to understand that why a plus b whole cube is equal to a cube plus 3a square b plus 3ab square plus b cube, of course, you can prove that geometrically, you can prove that algebraically, etc., etc. But as a student, it makes more sense for you just not to go into the nitty gritties of understanding that why a plus b whole cube generates this breakup, but just to memorize it or to apply it to solve mathematical questions, right? So this is a typical example of a rote memorization where let's say a plus b whole cube is equal to a cube plus 3a square b plus 3ab square plus b cube is something that you learn by heart without delving too much deeper into the logic of understanding that why a plus b whole cube expands into this equation. Okay, so this is a classic example of a rote memorization. Now on the other side of the spectrum, let's have a look at the second form of memorization, which is analytical memorization. Okay, now I assume that we are all from the management fraternity because we are aspiring to become project managers, etc, etc. And I hope we have come across this PDCA cycle, right? And this is also sometimes called as the Deming cycle, right? Now this PDCA cycle is what? It is basically a management philosophy or a management framework to drive a metric or drive a key performance indicator. Okay, you do something then you check whether you are doing it or correctly and if you are off track with respect to your check measures you act upon it to bring it back on track and then you go back again to the planning stage and you start planning with the next metric okay or you can start trying to keep on refining the existing metric as well so basically i assume that we all know this pdca cycle right now this is a typical example of an analytical memorization and why it is analytical because it will be very funny if I tell you that, OK, see, just memorize that after plan comes do, after do comes check, after check comes act, right? So we don't memorize it like that, OK? There is an analytical framework behind it, which makes you think that first you plan something, then you do it, then you check whether you are doing this correctly or not, and finally you go and action it, right? So there is a very logical flow of plan moving on to do, moving on to check, and moving on to act, right? So that is what is meant by analytical memorization. So you do not just commit it to memory that, OK, it is a PDCA cycle. First is plan, next is do, next is check, next is act, right? So that is meant by analytical memorization. And I hope you understand, guys, that what is the key difference between a rote memorization and an analytical memorization through this example. So with that context being said, let's look at how this concept applies for your PMP exam. Now, let's understand this chart very carefully, right? So first we have learned now that if it is rote memorization, it is difficult to infer intuitively, right? Or it is difficult to infer logically, okay? At least the very basic logic that we want to apply for any memorization technique, right? So for example, the A plus B whole cube formula, it is difficult to enter intuitively. You are better off by rote memorizing it rather than trying to understand how geometrically or algebraically A plus B whole cube breaks into the expanded formula of A cube plus 3A square B, blah, blah, blah right and when it comes to analytical memorization it's a very intuitive memorization which is plan first next is do next is check and next is act right now in terms of the general exams which is let's say you have your gmat exam you have your gre exam there are legal exams as well mathematical exams history exams right so when you remember the date or where you are expected to remember the years of significant historical importance right so these kind of exams have a heavy bias towards rote memorization okay so for example even if i talk about gmat or gre if you talk about like the logical reasoning or verbal ability you need to memorize a lot of verb forms you need to memorize a lot of grammatical syntaxes etc etc right so these kind of exams have a lot of rote memorization that is included with it right and there is very less intuitive memorization that you can do if you are appearing for such kind of exam for example tell me how much intuitive memorization is possible for a history exam right so i hope you understand this by this example so when it comes to these type of exams, which are professional exams, which are certification exams, which can be PMP, PRINCE2, APM, or your PMI ACP exams, the aspect of rote memorization is very, very less, right? So it is just converse to the normal exams of GMAT, GRE, or history exams. However, for these kind of exams, like the PMP exam, you have a lot of analytical memorization or intuitive memorization 
that you need to do okay now over the next sections we will focus on what is meant by this analytical or intuitive memorization however please note this guys every exam in this world needs some level of memorization it is very very important for you to understand that tell me in the comment section any exam which is a theoretical exam i am not talking about a practical exam which doesn't need any memorization, right? Tell me in the comment section. I'd be very interested to know that. But as far as my understanding and as far as my reasoning goes, every exam in the world needs some level of memorization. Now, the split between rote memorization and analytical memorization can vary exam to exam. But as a PMP exam candidate, please remove this taboo from your mind thinking that, okay, memorization is something that is bad or memorization is something that I don't want to do if I'm planning to write a certification exam, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay. Once you come out of this myth or once you come out of this taboo, it will be very easy for you to internalize this concept of analytical memorization when it comes to the PMP exam. Right. So now moving on, let's talk about the various topics of the PMP exam, which calls for memorization. Okay. Okay. Now, when PMP exam aspirants typically start facing challenges about the memorization of topics from the PMP exam syllabus, those are typically out of these six domains. Okay, First are the mathematical formulas and these are mathematical formulas based on your earned value management techniques or let's say the net present value or let's say the estimation techniques of triangular estimation or beta estimation, etc, etc. We'll see some examples very soon. Next, some critical path method formulas. OK, so what is total float? What is free float, et cetera, et cetera, and things like that. There is some bit of memorization. And I'm again coming back to this, that this is an analytical memorization I'm talking about. OK, so there is some bit of memorization involved in terms of understanding the type of procurement contracts. What is a firm fixed price contract? What is a cost reimbursable contract? What is a time and material contract? What is a FPEPA? OK fixed price contract with economic price adjustments. What is that? So there is definitely some bit of analytical memorization that is involved when you are learning the types of procurement contracts. The various ITTOs, right? The most used and abused subject of memorization, right? So the various ITTOs, which are the inputs, tools and techniques and outputs for each of the processes of your 49 process chart of PMBOK need some level of analytical memorization for sure, okay? Next, of course, the 49 process chart, the most daunting chart of your PMP exam practice guide or your PMP OK7. This also needs some level of analytical memorization. OK, and finally, the agile terminologies. So this also needs some bit of analytical memorization. For example, understanding that what is a sprint? What is a retrospective? What is a backlog refinement meeting? What is a spike and things like that? OK, so you have to learn these things to internalize and analytically memorize as much as possible so that you are able to apply those concepts during your actual PMP exam. Now, how to do it? We'll be talking these as part of the three strategies. But before that, let's look at some examples of these, right? So as I was mentioning mathematical formulas, I made a video long back on my YouTube channel. You can check this video, which explains how to create a brain dump when you are actually writing the PMP exam. Now, three years back, PMP had a lot of focus on mathematical problems. Now, there is no point making a brain dump because most of the problems which you will find in the PMP exam, which will be mathematics oriented, will be very analytical analytical and very scenario oriented. So I do not suggest that you start learning how to create a brain dump because a brain dump for the PMP exam in present times will not help you at all. And even more important, you need to understand the business linkage of these mathematical formulas. For example, how do you calculate the net present value? Or let's say, how do you calculate the number of effective communication channels between all of your stakeholders and things like that? OK, so if you're interested, please go back and watch this video where I have actually discussed these formulas and this might give you some perspective in terms of what kind of rote memorization techniques used to exist in the PMP exam at least two three years back okay but however this has changed a lot now and today's PMP exam is much more analytical you of course need to understand these formulas but also the skill on which PMI will be testing you on for these kind of mathematical problems is your ability to apply these mathematical equations to business problems to solve it and come up with a solution and to me it is even one step harder than just by rote memorizing mathematical formulas, okay? Because rote memorization is easy, right? Anybody can do it. Any Tom, Dick and Harry can memorize this uh, PV formula or NPV formula, right? However, to be a good PMP exam candidate, you should be having the skill of interpreting these mathematical formulas in business context. Again, we'll see that with some examples. Critical path method formulas. Again, I have a video on critical path method. If you are interested, please go ahead and watch the video. But when it comes to the critical path method formulas, 
there are formulas of early start early finish late start late finish total float free float etc etc right now if you are trying to memorize this just by rote memorization you'll have a very difficult time however if you plan to understand these using the analytical memorization ability this should be very easy for you okay and i would recommend that you go back and watch this video sometime during your pmp exam preparation process next type of procurement contracts again there is another video on these type of procurement contracts which is on my youtube channel i would recommend that you check it out but however in this video what i had done is i have actually helped you understand that how you can memorize the type of contracts based on an analytical ability so if you see this chart here i have categorized these type of contracts with respect to a x and y axis so in x axis it is the initial clarity of scope and in y axis it is the risk or impact on project cost for the buyer okay very important so if you start learning this type of procurement contracts based on this xy matrix that you see on screen it would become much easier for you to understand or let's say quote unquote memorize that okay what is a firm fixed price contract and what is the importance of firm fixed price contract in context of buyer and seller similarly what is a cost plus incentive fee contract and how it is high risk for the buyer and why these type of contracts are only applicable when the initial clarity of scope is towards the lower side right so if you start looking at things with this kind of analytical lens it will be very easy for you to do this analytical memorization for your pmp exam when i was preparing for my pmp exam of course i used this technique and hence it was very easy for me to learn the different types of procurement contracts again if you are interested to learn about this technique please go ahead and check out this video on my youtube channel next is memorization of ittos right the most used and abused topic of discussion with the pmp exam aspirants right now when it comes to the memorization of ittos if you have checked my itto playlist i talk about this flashcard technique right so you can use this flashcard technique to try and understand that how you would need to memorize this ittos in context of their content okay so for example when it comes to memorization it is not just memorizing that okay for identify stakeholders one output is stakeholder register one output is change request etc etc it's not like that right you need to understand that as a output of this identify stakeholder process the stakeholder register is definitely an output but what does it contain or what is the content of this stakeholder register which will help me eventually to identify my stakeholders correctly okay that is how you should approach in terms of memorizing that to identify stakeholders a key output is the stakeholder register which has some elements that will help me to identify my stakeholders better so that is the analytical part of this memorization again as a part of today's video i will solve some questions with you but if you want to delve deeper and try to understand the details behind each of these memorization techniques i will link all the videos in the description section of this youtube video please go ahead and start watching those videos after you have completed this video because that will start giving you things in perspective next memorization of the 49 processes again so this daunting chart which you will find in your process group practice guide i have made a video long back on my youtube channel to help you explain that how you can use logic and pattern to learn these 49 processes in the sequence in which they occur starting from initiating moving on to planning executing monitoring and controlling and closing okay again there is a lot of logic and pattern behind it and definitely not just a rote memorization and logically also if i give you an example let's take this one right so first you plan scope management right anyways the planning comes first then you collect the requirements you cannot collect requirements before you plan scope management right that is a very basic logical definition once you have collected the requirements then you define the scope again you cannot define the scope before you have collected the requirements right now if someone comes and says to me that okay ray i am just memorizing that first i have to do plan scope management then i have to collect requirements then i have to define the scope i think that's not the right way of learning this process group chart right you have to go logically and in terms of very basic reasoning as humans we need to understand that you cannot define a scope without collecting the requirements first okay so collect requirements has to come before you define the scope so these kind of things right so please go back and watch this video where i have actually discussed this method in detail so if you see this video has over 100000 views okay so it is safe to assume that this video is definitely communicating something which is helpful for pmp aspirants like you next agile terminologies right so sprint backlog scrum product stakeholders release etc etc right so again when you were studying for your pmp exam 
please go back to your uh, agile practice guide or whichever textbook you are following and learn these things in context now we'll understand that with examples that what it means by learning things in context okay now as a study aid when you are preparing the agile topics for your pmp exam there are videos on my youtube channel as well you can go ahead and watch those videos as well which will give you the analytical sense of how to learn these things and which will help you to interpret these as less of rote memorization and more of analytical memorization right again going back to my basic premise guys take this taboo out of your mind that memorization is bad all the theoretical exams in this world needs some bit of memorization guys period nobody can deny that fact if as a pmp exam aspirant you are trying to deny that fact and trying to be smart that okay i'll not memorize anything and i will score like uh, 80 80 80 on my pmp exam which is above target then you are just fooling yourself okay so come out of this taboo and start looking at things from an analytical lens rather than a rote memorization lens right so the first strategy of how not to memorize for your pmp exam right so start understanding things logically rather than mugging up okay now let's understand with some examples what is meant by understanding things logically and as an example we'll solve a question from this topic of procurement contracts okay so the reference video is this one you can go back and check the video later if you need a deep dive on this topic now when you are learning procurement contract guys you need to understand that each procurement contract is within a matrix of risk impact on project cost for the buyer versus the initial clarity of scope okay so for example when the initial clarity of scope is high and the risk impact on the buyer has to be low you go for a firm fixed price contract okay when the scope clarity is a bit less than high and still you want to be on the lower side in terms of risk for buyer you go for a fpif contract okay and on the other side of the spectrum if the risk impact on the project cost for the buyer is very high which means conversely the risk on the seller is very low and you have a very low clarity of scope you go for the cost reimbursable contracts okay so this is the basic premise of this chart which you are seeing on screen now now as part of this video there is a pdf study guide which you can download if you choose to watch this video after this session but for this session let's put this into application and solve this question okay so the question you see on screen guys is linked to the analytical matrix of procurement contracts that we saw right now so please pause the video here solve this question before we take this up together as part of our learning process right so let's get started and see how not to memorize for your pmp exam right the project manager is evaluating the most suitable type of contract for a hostel block refurbishment project which of the following contract types would be most appropriate when the buyer wants to shift the majority of the risk and control to the seller while providing the seller with maximum incentive to control costs and meet the project objectives and there are four options provided fixed price incentive fee time and material and firm fixed price contract now if someone is trying to memorize these items by rote memorization without understanding the logical explanation of it this question will be a very 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 high difficulty level question for that candidate okay however since you are my student and you are watching this video and you will be focusing more on analytical memorization let's understand and analyze this question right so this question is asking for a type of contract where the buyer wants to shift the majority of the risk and control to the seller right so the buyer wants to keep his or her risk low right so if you go back to this chart this is definitely in the low quadrant right so that is taken for sure this has to be in the lower side and on the other hand let's look at the next part of this statement that while providing the seller maximum incentive to control costs and meet project objectives okay now in this spectrum which you see where the risk impact on the project cost for the buyer is low what is the type of contract which provides an incentive to the seller right it is this one right firm fixed price contract is also something which is a low impact for the buyer however in the firm fixed price contract you do not have any incentive for the seller right so this option is incorrect so if you go here firm fixed price is definitely incorrect fixed price incentive fee looks like the correct option however if you check the contract types of cpff and the time and material contract in this chart you will see that both time and material 
contract and the CPFF contract falls in the higher spectrum of risk impact on the project cost for the buyer. Okay, so since this is on the high side, but in the question, it is stated that the buyer wants to shift the majority of the risk and control to the seller. That is why these options of CPFF and time and material contract are incorrect, right? So this is incorrect and this is incorrect as well. So the correct answer to this question is option B. So with this example, guys, I hope you are trying to get sense that how analytical memorization helps to solve questions very easily in your PMP exam rather than rote memorization. Let's look at another example now. So we'll go with the same drill here. Please pause the video read the question and try to answer it before we solve this together right so let's get started in an agile sprint the team has come up with multiple estimates for the time required to complete a user story okay multiple estimates the product owner plans to communicate a single estimate to the project manager to help develop the sprint schedule which estimation technique is most suitable in this scenario and there are four options three point estimate analogous parametric and expert judgment now for this you have to understand or you have to quote unquote have the analytical memorization capability to recall what is a three point estimate, what is an analogous estimate, what is a parametric estimate and what is a expert judgment, right? So if you are able to do that, this question can be answered in less than 30 seconds. Now, what is a three point estimate, guys? Three point estimate basically talks about estimating something based on three points or three reference points. One is an optimistic reference point, one is a pessimistic reference point, and one is a most probable reference point. Okay. So for beta estimation technique, the formula goes as P plus 4M plus O by 6. Let me go back to the relevant slide here. So basically, we are talking about this topic, which is a three point estimation. You have three points, and for triangular estimation the formula is p plus m plus o by 3 and for part or beta estimation technique the formula is p plus 4 m plus o by 6 and this is a three point estimation where you have multiple reference points but you come out with a single reference point okay so with that context being set let's go back to the question and see what the question is asking from us it is asking that the product owner plans to communicate a single estimate okay very important to the project manager to help develop the sprint schedule okay so i think by now many of you have guessed the correct answer to this question is option a which is three point estimate okay now you see that you do not need to memorize that okay for three point estimate the formula is p plus 4m plus o by 6 for beta distribution for triangular distribution p plus m plus o by 3 nothing of that sort guys right did i apply those rote memorization techniques to solve this question no right but i applied the analytical ability for me to understand that okay what is a estimation technique which is based on multiple estimation points but gives me a single estimate as an out and that is three point estimate what is analogous estimate an analogous estimate is something where you compare similar projects from your learn from experience or from your organizational process assets and apply something which has previously happened in some other project that is an analogous estimate okay parametric estimate is something which is done statistically okay so you have a statistical significance or confidence interval in terms of a estimate that you are coming up with so every estimate in a parametric estimate comes with a probability an expert judgment is very subjective where you talk to an expert or a subject matter expert to come up with some estimates okay so you also need to know these terms as part of the pmp exams syllabus so the correct answer is option a which is three point estimate now let's look at another example okay and this is an example from itto okay so i'll pause here please read the question and answer it before we take this together right so let's get started during the initiation stage of our office refurbishment project one of the key stakeholders was pulled off from the project team by their functional manager a new resource has been provided by the department to mitigate any risk however the project manager finds that the new person is uncooperative and disengaged which project artifact should ideally be revised to capture this change okay now this is a question of ITTO disguised in a scenario right so you need to understand how the ITTOs or the inputs tools and techniques and outputs works for each and every process of the 49 process chart you need not to memorize it but you have to learn analytically and we'll see in a second what analytical learning means option a stakeholder engagement plan change log stakeholder register and issue log okay now let's go back to this question we are talking about initiation stage right now in the initiation stage if you go back to your 49 process chart you will see that for the initiation stage the only activity for stakeholder you have is to identify the stakeholders right while you are identifying the stakeholders if you have learned the ITTO process chart of the 
identify stakeholders process well the main output of the identify stakeholder process chart is the stakeholder register just forget everything right if that's only one thing you need to remember out of this identify stakeholder process output it is this stakeholder register right so the project is in the initiation stage okay you are in identifying stakeholder process a swap has happened between a good stakeholder versus a not so good stakeholder who is uncooperative and disengaged so which project artifact should ideally be revised it should be stakeholder register because you are still at the initiation stage and the only document that you have at initiation stage of a project is the stakeholder register stakeholder engagement plan is not created yet because that gets created in the planning process right let's go back to the 49 process chart so you see that in the planning stage the plan stakeholder engagement occurs right and this is where the stakeholder engagement plan is created however your project is at the initiation stage at the moment so stakeholder engagement plan is not created yet in your project and that is why this is incorrect change log issue log so these are not at all created during the initiation stage of the project as well so these are also incorrect now note here that point number four says that project document updates okay it is not talking about project document creation so you definitely update issue log risk register assumption log etc but that is a cyclical process when you come back to it and update it if there are any changes but for initiation these documents are not created yet so during execution if this thing has happened that during the execution stage this swap has happened between the good stakeholder and the bad stakeholder then updating the issue log might have made sense right because during the execution stage you do have your issue log already available however since in this question it is talking about the initiation stage and it's not talking about out whether the project has moved literally from the initiation to the planning you do not have your change log you do not have your issue log and you do not have your stakeholder engagement plan as well okay so the correct answer to this question is stakeholder register so i hope with this example i was able to help you understand how you should go about quote unquote memorizing the 49 process chart and this ITTO charts to answer such questions which are of a very high difficulty level in terms of testing your analytical abilities again as a reference if you practice my ITTO quizzes you'll be able to learn more about this process of analytical memorization when it comes to your ITTOs for your PMP exam if you are preparing for your PMP exam guys I would suggest that you check out my PMP exam preparation courses on Udemy all the courses are very highly rated among students and many PMP aspirants like you have passed their PMP exam with the help of these courses. All the links will be provided in the description section of this video. Okay. And now let's move on to the second strategy when it comes to memorizing in your PMP exam. Right. So strategy number two in terms of how not to memorize for your PMP exam. And the strategy goes as learn to interpret equations to enable business decisions. I think we touched upon this initially when we were doing this discussion in terms of the introduction of this entire lecture that it is more important for you as a PMP exam aspirant to learn to interpret equations to enable business decisions rather than just rote memorization okay even if you are an expert in rote memorization you will not be able to answer a lot of pmp exam questions correctly because those are designed to test your ability to interpret those equations to enable business decisions so we'll understand this with some examples as part of this section of this entire lecture right so this is a question from the earned value management section of your PMP exam okay please read the question and try to answer it before we solve this together you can pause the video here now mind that this is a question of a very high difficulty level you will experience such questions occasionally in your PMP exam so even if you are masters in terms of rote memorization and you claim that okay you can memorize anything under the sun so EVM formulas are very basic for you and you think that you can just memorize it and pass the PMP exam try to answer this question okay you will see that this question cannot be answered through rote memorization okay so i'll pause here read the question and try to answer it right so let's get started a commercial building development project is envisaged to be completed in four phases okay so these are the four phases that has been discussed here each phase is about one year the planned estimates were 10 million 
at the end of each phase and for the next phase upon completion every year okay so that is basically a finish to start relationship that once you have finished year one and once you have finished the scope definition you move on to year two where you do the architectural design then you move on to year three where you do the construction and then you move on to year four where you do the design and the handover the phases have to be completed following each other in succession and that's what we discussed it's a typical finish to start relationship determine the cost variance at the end of three years so at the end of three years which is here okay you need to determine the cost variance okay now good luck with solving this problem with rote memorization okay right so now if you are on the other camp of analytical memorization let's try to understand this and solve this question okay so basically let's see scope definition year one so that is about like 10 million dollars right after year one these are the all the planned estimates okay after year two it will be 20 million dollars after year three the planned estimates will be 30 million dollars and after year four the planned estimate will be 40 million dollars okay so that is what the question is saying now it is also saying that year one you have started and you have finished year one similarly for year two you have started however you have not finished okay for year two so the scope of architectural design is not yet finished okay it was partially finished in year two and that spilled over to year three okay so initially even if you thought that you will be able to complete your architectural design and scope definition by end of year two the actual project slip and instead of completing this architectural design in year two you completed it in year three okay and when it comes to the construction you have started it and you have partially finished it okay and if you see here as the status for end of year three it is 50 percent complete okay and interior design and handover has not started yet okay? now you want to determine the cost variance okay so the only thing which you need to memorize for this formula is cost variance is equal to earned value minus actual cost okay this is the only rote memorization which you need to keep in mind to solve this question and the major part so this is only 20 percent of your problem but the majority 80 percent of the problem is understanding and analyzing what will be your earned value here and what will be your actual cost here okay so let's start to understand that one by one right so let's talk about actual costs okay now if you see that at the end of year three what has happened okay at the end of year three you have uh, completed phase one which is scope definition you have spent 10 million okay you have completed phase two which is architectural design and you have spent 12 million that's about 22 million spent already and next at the end of year three you are 50 percent done and you have spent already 9 million okay so that's 22 okay till here and then it's nine here so 22 plus nine that is 31 this is your actual cost at the end of year three so i hope you see that how i am analyzing the context of this question and coming up with the numbers okay which i'll fit into this equation eventually so my actual cost is 31 million dollars at the end of year three now what is my earned value guys so let's try to understand what is my earned value so for year one i have done it within 10 million okay so let's start adding up so for year year one my earned value is 10 million okay let's talk about year two so till year two what has happened let's see so at the end of year two my total planned budget should have been 20 million okay but what i have achieved as part of my earned value at end of year two so if you see here i was not able to complete the entire scope at the end of year two because this scope actually flowed from year two to year three now at the end of year three i have definitely completed this scope okay and if you see the entire calculation is happening for this problem at end of year three so at the end of year three what is the earned value for architectural design it is another 10 million dollars right because that is my earned value at the end of year three now the calculation mind that it is happening at end of year three it is not happening at end of year two so whatever you calculate or whatever you take as a reference it should be at the end of year three so at the end of of year three my architectural design is complete and that is giving me 
me earned value of 10 million dollars okay now let's look at the third stage which is construction so for construction it is 50 percent complete right now the planned value what it was it was 10 million dollars right another 10 million dollars which is 20 plus 10 that is 30 okay so another 10 million dollars at the end of year three and out of which i have only completed means only earned as part of my earned value is 50 percent of that worth of works okay so which is 50 percent okay 50 percent of 10 million dollars right which is 5 million dollars okay so my total earned value is 10 plus 10 plus 5 which is 25 okay that is my earned value of the works which is correct at the end of year three okay so at the end of year three my earned value is 25 million dollars what is my actual cost my actual cost is 31 million dollars so my cost variance is minus six okay and the correct answer to this question is option a which is minus six million dollars so i hope you have understood this question how i have solved it using my analytical ability of earned value management as a subject if you still have confusions please go back and watch the solution of this question once again and if you feel that you need a further theoretical understanding of the entire earned value management topic i would recommend that you check out my udemy course on earned value management as well so this is basically a sample question which i have taken from this course as part of this exercise okay right so let's move on to the next question so this is also another question which is let's say quote unquote a mathematical question but you tell me that how much mathematics is involved in this question okay so i'll pause here please read the question and solve it before we solve this together let's get started the quality manager for a project has handed over a quality risk rating chart to the project manager which looks as below so s is severity l is likelihood d is detectability one being the lowest and five being the highest okay if you have come across this matrix in your professional world this is typically called called as a SLD matrix okay severity likelihood and detectability matrix okay so QR is one severity is four likelihood is two there is a likelihood of detectability of rating two and similarly for QR is two there are some numbers provided QR is three there are some numbers provided okay what should be the correct prioritization for these risks starting from most critical moving on to the least critical now to answer this question guys you don't need mathematics knowledge beyond third grade mathematics okay but you need to understand what is a sld matrix and that is what is meant by you need not to memorize anything but you have to memorize or understand what is a sld matrix in a first place when it comes to quality management okay so in sld matrix what you typically do is you rate the severity the likelihood and the detectability of each risk you multiply the severity by the likelihood you multiply the likelihood by the detectability and that gives you something called as a risk priority number or rpn okay rpn risk priority number for each of these quality risk so the higher the risk priority number is the more critical the risk is and it needs to be addressed quicker than the other risks okay so with that let's calculate the risk priority numbers for each of these risks okay so for risk number one it is four multiplied by two multiplied by two that is 16 okay so for risk number two that is five multiplied by two multiplied by one that is 10 and for risk three it is 4 multiplied by 5 multiplied by 3 that is 60 okay 60 60 5 4 is a 20 multiplied by 3 is 60 okay so risk 3 is my highest risk okay then will come my risk 1 which i need to address and then will come my risk 2 which i need to address okay so risk 3 then risk 1 then risk 2 so the correct answer to this question is option a okay 30 seconds that's the maximum you need to solve this question if you have that analytical power of understanding how to interpret an SLD matrix okay and that is how you should be tackling mathematics or let's say memorization quote unquote questions in your PMP exam it is no way rote memorization guys but it is highly analytical memorization that we are focusing at the moment okay so the correct answer is option a if you're liking the video guys please press the like button and also subscribe to this channel PMP with Ray your support goes a long way to help this channel grow. Also, your likes and comments help me understand that you value such educational content on YouTube and motivates me to prepare more such videos like this to help you with your PMP exam preparation. And now, let's move on to the final and the most important bit of the memorization framework for your PMP exam.
Right, so we come to the third and the most important strategy for you to understand that how not to memorize for your PMP exam. And this strategy lies with the mindset, guys, okay? Memorization is not always bad if done with the right intent and mindset, okay? So in this section, let's understand what we mean by that. Now, as an example, guys, let's go back to our kindergarten days, right? We learned this sequence of English alphabets, right? A, B, C, D, A for apple, B for ball, C for cat, right? So now tell me guys, tell me in the comment section, I'd be interested to know your viewpoint that was this a memorization, okay? Were you memorizing that after A there is B, after B there is C, after B there is D and things like that? Of course you were doing it, right? So that was type of a rote memorization, okay? You were doing, there is no logical interpretation in terms of why B comes after A or why C comes after B, right? So there is no logic to explain why it is C after B and why it is not D after B, right? So it is a rote memorization. You memorized it by linking A to apple, B to ball, C to cat, etc, etc, right? So was this memorization? Yes. Was this a rote memorization? Yes, also it was a rote memorization. Was it bad? Of course it was not, right? Because that was the foundational stone of English language in our lives, okay? Understanding the English alphabets, okay? So please, please come out of this mindset of thinking that memorization is bad, okay? If a uh, exam is trying to make you memorize, it is a bad exam, or if an instructor is focusing on memorizing some bits and elements in the PMP exam syllabus, that instructor is bad and things like that, okay? So please come out of that mindset that memorization is bad okay memorization is not bad if done with the right intent okay now on the other side of the spectrum let's look at these five steps or the five processes of a project in terms of the life cycle starting with initiation then it's planning then it's execution then it's monitoring and controlling and then it's close out right so is this a road memorization guys of course not right so this is not a rote memorization it is a analytical memorization there is a very logical relationship why planning comes after initiation why execution comes after planning why monitoring and controlling comes after you have started execution right so there is a very logical relationship unlike why b comes after a or why c comes after b right and finally there is the closeout after monitoring and controlling so this is a typical example of analytical memorization where you use logic and common sense to understand or learn a subject okay so this is a very important mindset change that i would like you as a pmp aspirant to take home with you that memorization is not always bad if done with the right intent and when you are memorizing always look for the analytical part of memorization rather than rote memorization all right now this is a very important thought which i would like to leave you with guys okay pmi who is doing the pmp exam does not know that you are a project manager okay you are a good project manager bad project manager average project manager pmi doesn't know they doesn't know your background probably what they know at the maximum is you have done some projects you have submitted those projects as proof as part of your pmp exam eligibility etc etc okay they don't know you personally as a project manager right However, there should be some sort of a text-based evaluation process which PMI is doing through the PMP exam, right? Now, this is very interesting, guys. Since PMI is not knowing you as a project manager per se, but still you need to be awarded the degree of a PMP certified project manager, there has to be some sort of evaluation, right? Now, PMI can't like do an evaluation which is a practical evaluation for you, right? So let's say PMI can't say that, okay, I will monitor you or I will shadow you for like six, seven months and you do a project and I will see your performance of actually executing a project and after six months, I'll do an evaluation and give you the PMP certification. I hope it was like that, but it is not that, right? The PMP exam is a text-based exam and based on some questions and answers, PMI is trying to gauge your mindset and your skill as a project manager, okay? So for a text-based evaluation, guys, there has to be some sort of memorization, analytical memorization per se that needs to go in terms of the exam structure or in terms of the syllabus okay you are expected to memorize some things from the PMP exam syllabus which will help PMI to evaluate your potential as a project manager now you can keep on debating this topic guys but the exam structure will not change there is definitely some sort of analytical memorization bit that will stay within the PMP exam syllabus and as a PMP exam aspirant I will always recommend you to embrace it and to see it with the right mindset 
rather than being a keyboard warrior and debating over the YouTube comment section in terms of what is memorization and okay, this memorization is bad. Why do I need to memorize this? I am a project manager working for 15 years. Why am I expected to memorize this and that, etc, etc. So those discussions are futile, guys. That doesn't take us anywhere in terms of getting you the right certification. It is a text based exam. It is an exam where PMI is evaluating you as a project manager within a three hour or three and a half hour time frame there has to be some sort of text-based evaluation that needs to be done and whenever there is a text-based evaluation there is a sort of memorization that is involved with a text-based evaluation and i will end this video by leaving you with the learning that we had from this matrix that for the pmp exam there is only 20 percent which is rote memorization and 80 percent of it which is the majority of it is analytical memorization which is easy to infer intuitively and as a pmp exam aspirant please incline your mindset in that orientation and you will see that things are becoming easy for you as you go through the pmp exam syllabus because remember guys every exam in this world needs some level of memorization again let me know in the comment section i'd be very interested to know if you have come across a theoretical exam which calls for zero memorization i'd be very interested to know that Thank you for watching guys. I hope you found today's discussion helpful for your PMP exam prep, right? As a next step, you can watch why monthly question and answer practice sessions for your PMP exam from this playlist right here, where I have actually applied the framework of memorization that we have learned today to solve many PMP exam questions. Okay, so I'll see you again in one of the videos from this playlist.